And welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us this afternoon on uh, Learn with Google 2022. Uh, this is November 24. We are doing our final episode for the year. This is called Wrapping Up Your Year. And we've just got a bit of fun stuff to talk about today. Um, just you might like to round out your year with a bit of fun stuff. Who doesn't love doing that? Um, before we get started, uh, I will, on behalf of the Australians in the room, just welcome uh, you all and acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands upon which we meet today, wherever that is for you. Uh, I'm in um, Sydney on, on uh, Wadigal country. And Kimberly, you're in Kulin Nation, is that right? Yeah, I'm, I'm uh, in Melbourne, so it's the Wandry people of the Kulin Nation down here who've looked after our lands for very, very many centuries and done a wonderful job of it. Thank you. Oh, did I say Warrigal? I meant Gadigal. Gadigal is what I meant to say of the Eora Nation. I think you were combining the Wandry yeah. and the Gadigal people. I think I was. I think I was. So my apologies. But anyway, we'd like to uh, acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands, wherever it is for you, and acknowledge their customs and cultures that have nurtured and continue to nurture the land. Uh, and on behalf of our Kiwi friends, um, kia ora whanau. Uh, would anyone from New Zealand like to jump in and do a much better job of this than I'm likely to do? I feel like Andrew's going to, but he's still on, on mute. mute. Yeah, still on mute, Andrew. Oh, uh, yeah, sorry, on the mute. Um, yeah, happy to have our cousins across the dish. So kia ora whanau, nā mihi nui kia koutou katoa, kia papatuanuku tēnā koe, kia te whare tēnā koe, kia te tūpunu tēnā koe, tēnā koutou katoa, ti hei mauri ora. Lovely. Thank you, sir. Appreciate that. Uh, all right, uh, let's get stuck into it. This is the Google for Education team. I'm sure many of you on this call have met many of the people on this screen. Um, today, you have me, Chris Betcher, and uh, Kimberly Hall is here as well. Kimberly, give us a wave and uh, say something to appear in the video. <laughs> do I have to? <laughs> well, if you don't, if you don't say yeah, anything, yeah. you do and it, and it looks weird, like I'm talking to myself. Um, all right, so yeah, that's the whole team. Uh, just. You know, anything you need, just reach out. We love helping uh, you guys. All right, um, today's agenda, we're going to talk about a few things. Uh, let's spend a moment talking about wrapping up the year with Google Takeout. There's been a couple of changes to Takeout recently um, that we just want you to be aware of. Um, but just as, as, you know, as your kids wind up and maybe you've got some staff leaving, uh, let's talk about how they might be able to take some of their stuff with them if you allow that to happen. Um, and because there's only really, for a lot of us, there's only really a few weeks of school left. We thought we'd just dig into some of the fun stuff you might like to just do with your kids over this next couple of weeks, uh, assuming you have time to do it. If it's not too, too busy. Um, so we'll have a look at some Google experiments that are kind of fun. Um, we'll just remind you again about digital skills and some of the great stuff that's in there in case you're looking for uh, activities to do. Um, let's revisit Quick Draw. I know some of you have seen it before, some of you may not have. So we'll just have a quick look at that, and then we'll wrap up with all the new stuff that's come out in the last month. Now, I think we did kind of miss one last month. I was away. Steve went to run last month's webinar, but I don't think the invitations went out, so I don't think anyone actually came to it. So we've got two months of uh, updates to catch up on, so that'll be fun. All right, uh, I'm liking this slide changing thing. Um, how, just a show of hands, how many people have heard of Google Takeout before? Give me a wave. Okay, a few people, excellent, fantastic. So for those that don't know, because <clears throat> there was quite a few hands that did not go up, um, Takeout is a service that Google offers for you to be able to basically take out the stuff that you've got in your Google Drive uh, and, and lots of other Google services as well. Uh, it's a great idea for graduating students. So when you're year 10s or year 12s or whatever your oldest years are, your year sixes, um, if you'd like to allow them to take some things with them as they finish up at school, you can do that. Uh, it's really good for staff that are leaving because it, although it lets them take a copy of their stuff, it also leaves their stuff in the school as well. It doesn't actually uh, delete it from the school. Um, so that's a nice nice win-win for, for the school and the teacher. Um, you can export all sorts of stuff out of Takeout, including your bookmarks and Google Earth projects and your photos and your drives, mail, all that sort of stuff. You can do it all. So we'll show you how to do that. The, the interesting thing is that... Um, Takeout operates on an OU basis. That's an organizational unit basis. So uh, I know if you're a, a regular classroom teacher, you probably don't have access to the back end of um, workspace. So you don't <coughs> probably see these organizational units too much, but your administrators can actually make this available to certain groups and not others. So just be aware that that happens. 
The other exciting thing is uh, there's a part of um, takeout called takeout transfer. So the normal takeout service lets you basically export everything out from your Google service. But if you're using transfer, you can actually just move it to another Google account. So rather than double handle everything and sort of pull it out and have to put it back somewhere, you can actually just move it directly from one Google account to another, which is really handy. So I'm going to try and show you this. So let me just switch to a different tab. Uh, and I'm just going to type in my, I know you can't see my typing bar, but I'm just typing in takeout.google.com. And it takes me to this page right here. And this is what it looks like. So I did one earlier today just to sort of, you know, test it, make sure it's all working as I expected, and it is. Uh, so it tells me this is my latest export that I did earlier today. But if I just scroll down the page a bit, you'll see here's how it really works. You select the data you want to include. Uh, by default, um, I think it's all selected by default. I usually go deselect de uh, de everything so that nothing's selected, and then I go through and pick the ones I actually want. If you've got a lot of stuff in your Google Drive, it's going to be a really, really, really big backup. And so um, you, you probably only want to take the stuff you really need. Otherwise, it's just excessive file size for no real purpose. So I might come in here and say, for example, I want to get all my classroom data. Maybe I need my, um, uh, what else can I get in here? I can get my Google Photos, perhaps. I want my Google Photos that are out of there, and so on. And you come down here and you select what you want. Now, some of them, like Google Drive, for example, when I get down to Google Drive, I I've gone past it. Uh, did I go past it? Maybe. No, I didn't. Oh, did I? Um, there's so much stuff in here. Uh, Google Drive, Drive, Drive. Hmm. Interesting. Control F, <laughs> Drive. Uh, well, I'm not showing up. That's really weird. Okay. Um, some of the things in Drive. Uh, it, it, oh, there it is. Google Drive. Okay. Thank you. Um, some of the things in Drive. So if I turn on Drive and I say I want to export from Drive, you can see I've got some options in here. First of all, I can go into which drive data I want. So within my Google Drive, I have all these different sort of folders and things. I can deselect that and only tick the ones that I want. So I can leave out certain files. So you know you don't have to back up everything. Like I said, backing up everything takes a lot of storage. So you want to be a bit selective. If you don't need something, don't take it. Um, and then the other thing is, especially with Drive, you can go in here and click on this Formats button. And you can choose. So, for example, if you're exporting out Google Docs, like what do you want them to come out as? They can't come out as a Google Doc, obviously, because that needs to be something that lives online. If you're exporting it, it needs to be converted to something that's standalone. Uh, and so the obvious one there is to come out as a docx file or a PDF. So you can choose which version you want. And it's the same with um, uh, presentations. It'll come out of slides, and you can have it either go to PowerPoint or PDF. Same with spreadsheets. You can go to um, what did Microsoft call that? Excel, uh, it has a name. Um, so you, you can put all your settings in there and decide how you want things to come out. So, And as you look through this, you'll see you get a couple of different options for each of these things. So go through, check which ones you want. And once you've done it, um, you end up with uh, an export. And you get this little panel at the top here. It says download. You click the download button, and it downloads. Now, I've already done this, so I won't do it twice. Um, I'm just going to go in here and share. This is my uh, file manager on my Chromebook. If I go into my downloads folder, you'll see there is there is the takeout file that I did earlier today. And if I open it up, it's got a folder in there called takeout. And I, all I exported out of mine was my bookmarks and my um, arts and culture collections. So if I go into the Chrome folder, there's a bookmarks thing there. I click on that and share that tab so you can see it. This is what it gives me. So it just gives me like a HTML list of all my bookmarks. And I can just go and move that back in, import that back into another browser if that's what I want to do later on. So I hope that makes sense. Now, the other thing I mentioned that you've got takeout.google.com, but if you add slash transfer onto the end of that, um, spell that correctly, transfer, um, then it brings you to this page where you can actually transfer your thing. So you put it in a destination account. So assuming you have another Google account, it could be just any Gmail account, and I believe it also works with other uh, workspace accounts, so long as the administrator allows it, um, you can just export directly from one Google account straight to another Google account. And I would always sort of, with my graduating students, probably recommend that. A lot of my year 12 students had, had Gmail accounts. 
and they can just go straight to that Gmail account and just pull all their stuff across. Just put in where it's coming from, verify the account, select which co which content you want, hit a button, and it just transfers. The transfer can take a long time depending on how much they're doing. They can take uh, it can literally take days uh, depending on what they pick. So be patient with it. All right, uh, Steve. Hello. Kia ora, Chris. Kia ora, everyone. Hey, look, the, the transfer thing I think is awesome because I know that when I left my last school, I had something like 300 gig in my drive. Um, and so the takeout download took a long time. So the transfer thing is awesome. Nice. Good point. Really good point, mate. Yeah. Um, Steve, I'm just, I just made you and Kimberly uh, co-hosts, just in case you want to Sweet. use your superpowers to be good. I was going to say, that sounds like that could be dangerous. So. Yeah. Oh, right. that's for good. So that is uh, that is takeout. I don't know if anyone has any questions about that, but it's a super useful thing to do at this time of the year, uh, just to grab your stuff. Uh, all right, let's um, move on to the next slide. I just, yeah, now a recent thing that just happened, and I think this happened literally like last week or the week before. There is now some admin controls for certain things inside takeout that you can control. Now it's not everything at the moment, so it's basically for any Google services that. Um, that have an individual on and off control. So that's not everything, but the list that I have there, blogger, books, maps, pay, photos, the play console, location, history, and YouTube, those things can be turned on or off in the admin console. So basically, uh, an admin could go in and say, like, turn off YouTube, for example, and it now means that student, even if they want to take all their takeout stuff, they won't see YouTube as an option, right? So you can turn on or off certain things now, uh, and that's in the admin console. Um, I don't know if I need to show that, but if anyone wants me to show that later on, just give us a yell and I'm happy to jump into the admin console and show. All right. Uh, Kimberly or Steve, do you have anything to add? Because I feel like I'm doing all the talking. No, I think that I think that, that takeout, the changes to takeout are fantastic and the ability to switch it on and off um, by product is really cool as well. And I think the nice thing about takeout is that it'll take a copy of your stuff. Yeah. It won't delete everything. And also it'll only take stuff that you own. So, you know, you can't take everything with you if you don't own it, which is always nice, and the stuff stays there. So it's a, it's a great tool to talk to people about. Yeah. I, 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 I've spoken to teachers over the years that have got themselves in a bit of a situation at the end of the school year where they kind of they raid the filing cabinet and take all their resources, and then they don't leave it for the other teachers at the school. So the nice thing about takeout is they can take their stuff and they can leave their stuff. Yeah, that's probably the discussion around uh, using Vault effectively as well. So that yeah. can't happen. Yeah, definitely. Now, I, while you're talking there, Steve, I did actually just jump into the admin console. So I'll just for, for for completeness, I'll just show where that is. It's in you go into the account section in here, and there's now a section in the account part of the console called Google Takeout. And when you go into the takeout section, and obviously when I say you, this is a, an administrator that does this. Um, you, first of all, you can decide whether the service is on or off at all. So you can turn it on for some OUs and off for others. Uh, but then this is where I was talking about the user access to Google services. Um, and when you go in here, you can sort of turn on or off which services you want to allow. And if I just show you an example in here, I'm going to go in here in our little de demo class. You can see we've got a folder called Chris's Kids and Steve's Kids. Um, if I go into Chris's Kids, you see what I've just done is I've allowed my group of students to have Google Photos and YouTube, but I've turned off everything else. So if I was to come in here as a student now and look and see what I have access to, I wouldn't have all this other stuff. I'd only have, like I'd have all the standard stuff minus those things, which I've disallowed. Yeah, and Chris, um, Erica had a, a question before about the fact it needs to be switched on, which I just answered for us. So yeah, this yep. is one of those things you need to switch on for people. So it may be that you allow it for only your senior students and your teachers and not kind of your, your, your lower year students perhaps. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. Um, anyway, so that's how it works. And like I said, there is an on-off switch just generally for it. So and your admin would need to turn that on. And, and look, very often, you know, it's often the situation in some schools where there's so much stuff in the admin console now that sometimes administrators simply don't know what they don't know. They don't realize it's a service, so they just don't know they haven't turned it on. So sometimes if you see something we're talking about and you think it's good, go and mention it to them because maybe they've just overlooked it and they just weren't aware. Um, so it's not always the reason that they, you know, they just simply don't want you to use it. Sometimes they just don't know. All right, uh, let's jump back into our slides. So let's uh, now Google Experiments. I, I had some fun with this earlier today. There is 
so many Google experiments now, and we've talked before on this uh, webinar about the arts and culture experiments. And I think we've looked at things like Blob Opera and a few other things. Um, there is actually a much broader collection of experiments. And it's just at experiments.withgoogle.com. So I'm just going to jump in there and show you what I'm talking about. Uh, here we go. So this is experiments with Google. And if you go into the collections list, you'll see there are all different collections of experiments. So like I said, we've previously talked a fair bit about things like the Chrome experiments. And some of you might remember we talked about um, Chrome Music Lab, uh, which is particularly great for uh, younger kids experimenting with sound and audio. We've looked at the arts and culture experiments, but there's a whole bunch of other ones there on things like, you know, um, augmented reality experiments, AI experiments, um, WebXR, which I'm not even sure what that is, but it's some sort of technology, and they're doing experiments with it. <laughs> um, digital well-being experiments. And this is just like folk at Google who have weird ideas about what we might build, and they can come in here and just sort of dump their ideas in here as experiments and have people play with it. Um, it is very much beta. So sometimes you come in here, I was playing around with this today and, and there were a few broken links and things in there where things have obviously been deprecated or forgotten or whatever. Um, so you, you might find some broken things in here, but for the most part, there's a lot of really interesting things in here. Um, now I've pulled out a couple that I found particularly interesting earlier today, but I'm weird and I might find things interesting that you don't. So what I'd encourage you to do is go and experiment and explore the experiment collection at experiments.withgoogle.com because there's some really, really interesting stuff in there. Now, I've decided that two of my favorites that I want to show you today, or maybe three, is this one called Visual Crosswords. I used to be an art teacher, um, so I find this a bit interesting. But if I go to Visual Crosswords, this is a crossword puzzle that is not done with letters, but it's actually done with images. So let that load for a second. So uh, now I got up to level four and then got stuck. So I don't, I don't know how to get past level four. I'm going to go back to uh, back to level one. Okay. So this is a really simple one. I got two crossword things with three things, and I got six pictures down the bottom. And I'm going to basically sort them out into contemporary art and Renaissance art. So I'm pretty sure, pretty sure that's contemporary, and probably that's contemporary. That looks Renaissance to me. So does that. Um, and let's try that. We'll put that there and there. Now it'll tell me I got something wrong down the bottom there. So I removed the wrong items. Uh, so I got those two wrong. So I think, okay, that must be the contemporary and that must be the Renaissance. Yay, got to the next level. So when you go to the next level, now it's uh, two artists, Van Gogh and Gauguin. And here's how the crossword thing works. So I can say, okay, well, uh, I know this painting here, I know that's a Van Gogh, so I'm gonna put it in the Van Gogh column. And I know that's a Van Gogh. And I'm pretty sure that's a Gauguin and that's a Gauguin. And it leaves me one painting in the middle, which is interesting because that's actually a painting of Van Gogh by Gauguin, right? So that's why it's in the cross, where the two things cross. So a lot of these puzzles that do that kind of thing, they'll, they'll do these little visual things. Here's one where we can do colors. I've got these paintings down the bottom. I've got green across the top, yellow, I've got red, I've got blue. And the idea is you sort the paintings out into which one is just blue, uh, so that would be maybe that one. And which one is just yellow, that would be maybe that one. But this one's got blue and yellow, so you try and figure out where that could possibly go. And so you, you're just doing a crossword, but with visuals. So I thought that was a bit of fun. You might not. Um, you might want to find something else, and that's cool. Um, the, sorry, I heard someone breathe. That was you, Steve. <laughs> Did I breathe that loud? Oh, my God. Well, I was just saying, I dropped one in the chat, which is uh, the British Museum experiment, and it's basically got a timeline of everything in the British Museum. And you can then link like cultures, you can link times, you can link uh, continents. So it's an, um, that's one of my favorite experiments, which well, may, is maybe weird in a different way. I don't know, but it's a really, really great one. I just feel like these, uh, these th sort of things may be a good thing for that end of year thing when you're trying to get the kids, you've got a little bit of spare time, you're kind of wound down, you've got most of your assessments done and you're trying to give your kids something sort of interesting to play with and think about. Um, that, that could be a good thing to just let them have a little look through here or direct them to it. I've got to tell you, my absolute favourite, Steve, is this one, the Freddie Mercury one. Have you done this one? I haven't seen that one. I, I am not going to do this in front of everybody because I've... Oh, is that how Freddie are you? Yeah. How Freddie are you? So this yeah. is a Freddie meter. And what you do is <laughs> you pick your favourite Queen song, right? So let's do Bohemian Rhapsody. And basically then it's like I'll karaoke. the hardest one. 
Don't the, think the absolute hardest one. You pick the hardest one. Please sing. Please sing, Betcha. Please sing. <laughs> and then Mama. Mama just killed a man. Put a gun against his head. And so on. I'm not going to go any further. Um, <laughs> It hasn't rated you yet. You have to keep singing it until it's gone. Go back and start singing again. No, 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 I'm not. (laughs) And what it does, though, it'll give you a score of how Freddie Mercury are you. It'll it'll look at how much you stayed in pitch, how much you stayed in time, and how much timbre or timber, however you say that word, um, your voice is that sounds like Freddie Mercury, and it'll give you a Freddie score. So and I'm not going to embarrass myself in front of all you people, but I did get 78% on the Freddie score earlier today. Just saying. Wow. How many times did you sing it, Betcha, to that get to 78? Time. I got a good for Bohemian Rhapsody, but we are the champions. I completely messed up. So. Nice. Hey, Steve, we're getting feedback from you just because you'll keep flicking onto the video and the recording. So anyway, so Freddie is fun. Uh, I would check that out. Get your kids to do that. I reckon that if I was in a classroom, getting my kids to do that like in front of the rest of the class would be a lot of fun, I would think. Um, and just uh, because, again, because I like weird things, um, there's this one as well, which I also found interesting. This is from the Arts and Culture Experiments. It's called Art Palette. So there's lots of paintings uh, in the world, and there are thousands of them inside the Arts and Culture collection. And you've got a palette along the top here, and you can mix and match this palette to whatever colours you want, and it'll find artworks in the collection that match that palette scheme. So I'm just going to go surprise me, and it'll give me a random palette, and now it's looking for paintings that match that palette, which I think is just kind of interesting and cool. If you're teaching colour theory to kids or you're just just getting to look at history and look at the artworks and stuff, uh, it's an interesting jumping-off point. You can click over each one and sort of pick. So if I add something really like blue into that, which is, I don't know why I do that, but yeah. So you find paintings now that have that same scheme, but it's got blue in it. And let's mix it up. Let's put some green in the corner. Boom. And so now I get those paintings. So I think it's really interesting in terms of just, I don't know, I just found it interesting. I don't know why I found it interesting. I just do. And that's the thing with these experiments. Sometimes they're just interesting ideas. Um. Any thoughts, comments? Hoping I don't get feedback. Now, I, I will drop one in the, in the chat I found the other day, which is called Which Came First? So oh, it's part yeah. of arts and culture, and it's, you've got two artifacts. You've got to figure out which is the oldest. So oh. could possibly. And, and that, that Freddie Mercury thing that is, is really cool, but it's also a really nice way to – it's another end talking about AI with kids and how AI can, can listen to stuff and then give you feedback on it. So yeah. – Quite a cool little teaching resource. Absolutely. And that's that's kind of the underlying thing. These are fun to do, but it's looking at maybe having discussions about some of the underlying stuff. It's, it gets really interesting. The uh, Some of the others I put on here, I won't do them for you, but like this one here, um, I'm not, you're not seeing my mouse, are you? Oh, interesting. Um, the one with the flowers there, that's um, like a, uh, a, a digital wellness one. It, it gives you, it puts you in this sort of digital garden and the flowers expand and contract and you breathe in time with the flowers and sort of do, you know, slow down and digital wellness. There's some drawing games. Uh, there's all sorts of interesting stuff in there. So check it out. Um, there's, there's more than I can possibly discuss. Um, the other thing that you might like to think about at this end of year time is the applied digital skills stuff that we do. Um, so this, obviously, you can use this any time of year. Uh, and we hope you do, but um, if you're looking for something for your kids to do right now, uh, Applied Digital Skills is a, a, just a massive collection of lessons that will walk students through the creation of digital artifacts and it will teach them a bunch of skills along the way. Um, it does link to Google Classroom, which is nice, uh, that you can actually link the class inside Applied Digital to the class inside Classroom and you can share things back and forth that way. Um, and there's some new collections in there now too, the Google Career Certificates and the Small Business Skills courses. And let me just jump in there and show you what I'm talking about. So this is Applied Digital Skills, and it's just applieddigitalskills.withgoogle.com. Uh, and so I can come in here, and uh, because I've set this up earlier as a teacher, you see if I go to my dashboard, uh, it will, and the first time you do this, it'll ask you, are you a teacher, are you a student, are you just an interested person just wanting to build your skills? But I've created a class as a teacher, and I've actually connected it to my Google Classroom. 
So now when I uh, create something in here, like if I go to add students, for example, I think I did this earlier, but what it does is it invites the students. It doesn't just add them. So the students have to accept the invitation. So you can see there's all my students there waiting with an invite pending for them to accept the invitation. Um, and any lessons that I've pushed out to those students, uh, asking me, um, I want to click that, stop it. Um, so I've, I've pushed out this lesson about making a flyer to those students. And it's going to track here for me. It's going to tell me which students have completed it, what percentage of the lessons have been completed, uh, what activities each student has viewed. So I'm getting a sort of a dashboard back end so I can actually see the progress of the kids as they go through these lessons. Now, the actual lessons, if I click up here on Browse Lessons, um, you'll see that this is the collections thing I was talking about uh, when it loads. Believe me, they're not actually all blank. There you go. Um, so these are lessons. So you've got Explore Google Career Certificates. There's like a collection of five lessons in there. There's some college readiness stuff, some computer science week stuff. There's 11 lessons for that. Um, you know, the idea of developing uh, entrepreneurial skills. There's six lessons to help you do that. And if you scroll down a little further, there's there's like there's just tons of lessons. Each one takes about 45 to 90 minutes, which is perfect. It's usually like if you're a high school teacher, that's like one or two periods. If you're um, a primary school teacher, I guess you can spread that out over whatever time length you like. But lots of lessons in there. As you can see, you can push that out directly to Google Classroom for your kids. And there's a filter on the side here. So if you're looking to do a particular topic, so perhaps you know, you're teaching, uh, I don't know, let's say maths. So I click on math, and it's going to filter down to all the things that have to do with math. Uh, and, it, and you might say, well, my kids are really good at Google Docs and Google Slides, but they don't do much stuff with forms. So let's use forms. Okay, so there's a lesson about maths using Google Forms. So you can filter it down and sort of pick out a, a, a useful lesson depending on what needs you have. And you can filter by audience as well. Obviously, if you over filter, you're going to get either potentially just one lesson or maybe no lessons. Um, so they don't over filter it, but uh, browse through there and just see there's lots and lots of interesting things. Does anyone in the group um, use this with their kids at all? Hey, Chris, um, I'm just going to, you, you can see that the, um, the adult learners is a, a topic in there and I think this is one of those really amazing resources that are great for our community so yeah. parents Fano of of our kids who want to upskill themselves with digital skills this is an amazing resource for them that's a really good point Steve. yeah I, I, I just think about using it in class but you're right to get um, parents who sometimes struggle with their own digital literacy would be a really useful skill hmm. there you go uh, all right, so that is um, applied digital skills. It's one of the one of the many services we offer. <laughs> um, all right, uh, let's move on to quick draw. And I know some of you have seen this before, but I'm sure there are people who have never seen this before. So just have a little bit of fun with this. Quick draw is a uh, it's a game basically, that but it's it's more than a game. It actually teaches as you use this game, you're actually teaching a neural network how to recognize objects. You're teaching the artificial intelligence on the back end what things look like. And so you're actually contributing. This is the world's largest doodling data set. And so all these little doodles you can see here. Um, and here's what I think is fascinating. If I was to point at something here, so if I pointed that, most people could tell me that is a cake, right? Cake. And, and like, how do you know that? How do you know it's a cake? You just do, right? It's not a photograph. It's just a couple of lines. This one here next to it or nearby, is that's, that's a, clearly, a butterfly. But how did you know that? So somewhere deep in your brain, you're, you've been wired to understand that like a couple of lines that curve around like that with a bit in the middle and a couple of prongs out the top, that's supposed to be a butterfly. And you've just learned that. And as a human being, you just kind of know. But a machine doesn't know that. So what this game does is it teaches it. So let me just jump over to quick draw. Hey, Chris, um, yeah, look, another great resource for teaching the difference between AI and ML. Mm. If, if you really want to talk about the difference between AI and ML, this is such a great resource to use because you've got the AI when it's guessing and then the fact it takes in all, well, for me, my terrible sketches um, and adds it to, which is which is the machine learning part of it. So really cool resource. I'm going to try and do this. So, so if, for those that haven't used this before, when I click this Let's Draw button, it's going to present me with six different um, things to draw. And I have to have a go at drawing it. I'm going to get, I don't know, 20 seconds or something each, right? Um, sometimes I get it, sometimes I don't. So I'll say, let's draw. Okay, pair of scissors. I got 20 seconds to draw a pair of scissors. Let's see. So a pair of scissors, um, I guess, like that and like that. Um, and down the bottom it says, oh, I know, it's scissors. 
Are you getting the audio? Oh, oh, some people said yes, some people said no. Okay, so I'll try another one. A goatee. Oh my god, a goatee. Um, mm, ah, <laughs> got it. Draw a hamburger. Uh, hamburgers, uh, I don't know, like that. And like that. Right. Now, here's what I think is interesting. Like, how did it know it was a hamburger? It was literally a few lines that looked like nothing until. I put the curve on the top and the dots, and all of a sudden I knew it was a hamburger because that was its hamburgerness, right? Um, a school bus. Uh, draw it on a school bus. I, I don't know how it knew it was a school bus. Snowflake. Uh, um, really? Come on, Google. And a, finally, a lantern. Um, I have no idea how I knew that was a lander. But there's my six drawings, right? Now, here's the interesting bit. I'm going to pick uh, scissors because it's an obvious one, right? If I click on scissors, it says, okay, you drew this. It could have been a spoon, could have been a seesaw. They're kind of similar objects. But if I scroll down the page, I see everybody else's drawing of scissors. And suddenly now what I'm seeing is that scissors, there's, there is a certain something that all scissors have that, that have in common and if I can just get enough examples of that thing that that has in common, I can now teach the machine what a pair of scissors is. And so that's one example. If I go, let's go back to uh, just one more here. We'll look at hamburger, right? Again, that's what I drew, kind of, sort of. I thought it might have been a donut or a bun. But there's everybody else's hamburgers, right? And, and so, again, it's this idea that, first of all, it's a bit of fun. I've done this with kids. I've done this with adults. And as you're doing it and they're trying to draw and the machine's going, oh, it's a this, it's a that. Oh, I don't know what it is. Like, it's hilarious. And, and everyone's falling about the place laughing. So it's a really good fun activity for the kids. But beyond the fun activity, there's this whole conversation that prompts about the use of machine learning, the use of artificial intelligence and what all that means. And when you come back to that home page, uh, remember we started here and this, this, this talks about the world's largest doodling data set. If you click on that, it actually brings up this is the data set that, that was, has been built. And I think it's what, 50 million drawings, right? So there's a lot of drawings in here. And I think I used the example before of the butterfly. So if I go to butterfly and click the butterfly, you'll see there is everybody's butterflies. And you start to see, you know, there's a, there's a real concept of butterflyness. And if you can capture that by having enough examples of it, then the machine can actually learn what that actually means. I, so, I, Chris, I, I, um, I, sh I shared this at a workshop earlier in the year and someone said, so so you could actually game this and, and draw cats when it says dog and, and change the data set? And I said to him, maybe on day one, but now there is so much in the data set that will negate your incorrect drawing that you probably can't game it anymore. Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't realise I wasn't sharing my screen before when I was talking about that. But, um, yeah, that's the data set I was talking about there. There's all the butterflies. Um, it's it's yeah you're right. It's one person could come in and draw a dog instead of a butterfly and try and ruin the system, but it'd take a mass conspiracy for everybody to do it, right? So the chances are it's not going to happen. It's a bit like Wikipedia. You know, one person can go in and do a spurious edit, but thousands of other people are not going to let that edit survive. And it's kind of the same idea here. All right, so that's a bit of fun with quick draw. Let's go back to our slides. Um, so. Let's just wrap it up by talking about some of the stuff that's new in Google for Education uh, in the last, uh, well, two months, really. So first of all, the new Gmail user interface. Um, some of you well, some of you have been using this for a while. It's been optional for a while. It's no longer optional now. It's it's the stuff, that, it's the one that everybody gets. So if I just go and open my email, I'll show you kind of what I mean. <coughs> and this is, uh, oops, click the stop sharing button instead of the, Show my screen button. It's, I'm silly. Okay. It's coming back. Okay, there you go. So just going to my email, you'll just see you've got these buttons down the side here. Again, some of you have had this for a long time. This is not new. But for some of you who were clinging on, <laughs> hoping to not lose the old interface, uh, you know, you don't, you, you don't have that choice anymore. Now it's this is the one you get. And it's got mail, chat, spaces, and meet all down the side, and you can easily switch between the two. 
I really like this interface because I'm constantly flipping between chat and mail and spaces and occasionally using meet from here as well. Um, and I like the fact that when I click on the chat, it actually switches to the chat. The other thing too, it has unified search now. So if I go in here and I'm searching for um, uh, b -b 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 Steve, right? right, And it's gonna find me stuff from Steve. Um, I'll do that. It's gonna load. Uh, but if I switch over to chat, oh, oh, I messed this up. It's not doing it for me because I pressed the wrong thing. But it does. It will actually search across all the different things. So you know when you get that thing you can't remember. Did it, was it an email? Was it a was it a chat? How did that message come to me? I just forget. Um, so you can actually search across all of the different services now, and it will find it no matter where it is. Only for you to probably find it was a text message on your phone or something like that. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so that's that's the thing in uh, in the mail. Um, there's also some enhanced menus in Google Slides and Drawings now. So if you've been paying attention, I'll just escape out of here. Uh, and so I'm just going to Google Slides here, and you'll see uh, now if you go to the menus now, you'll notice you've got little icons in front of everything now. Uh, what we've discovered, our research has been telling us that you know, when you put those little um, icons in front of everything, it just helps people find things a little bit quicker. It's just easier. A lot of people are very visual. They look for the, the visual clue. But we've also rearranged a few things in here as well. Um, and I can't tell you exactly what the changes were. I just know that sometimes when I'm looking for something, it's not where I thought it was. Uh, and I'll just have a bit more of a hunt around. It's probably in a more logical place now than it used to be. So um, just be aware that that has changed slightly in slides. Uh, also in drawings as well. There's been some menu changes there. Um, we talked a little earlier about the consolidated controls for takeout and how now you can specify certain things you, you can turn on or off in takeout. Um, transcribe speech during a Google Meet call into a Google Doc is a new one as well. Um, back the screen again. Uh, and kind of hard to demonstrate for you because we're recording a Meet call right now. And at the end of this, uh, this, this uh, webinar, I'm going to hit the stop recording button. And uh, it, probably 10 minutes later, 15 minutes later, I'll get a notification saying that that video is now ready for me sitting in my Google Drive in a folder called Meet Recordings. But I also have the option now of getting a transcript of everything that was said in the call. So everything I've said, everything Steve said, everything Kimberly said, like it, I'll get a Google Doc that's usually many pages long um, and I can search that. And if I'm trying to find something that got said in the call, it's usually easier to go to the transcript and do a control F and find it than it is to try and just hunt through, you know, an hour of video, 40 minutes of video, whatever. And so, the point about that, Chris, is that you could grab that transcript, chuck it into, into translate and put it into any language you want to do as well. Oh, well, that's it. I hadn't considered that. No, that's great. There you go. You're awesome. welcome. I like that. Um, we've got a thing called timeline view in sheets. And uh, I, should have, I should have created a uh, sample file for this, and I did not. So I'm just gonna jump in here real quick and try and show you something. So here's Google Sheets. Uh, and so I'm just gonna create a little bit of um, dummy data here. I'll say Steve, uh, Chris, Kimberly, right? And I might have some start and end dates for something. So maybe I need to just put a line above that one. We'll sort of, sort of row above that. And we'll call this column name, and we'll call this one start, and we'll call this one end. Right, and I'm just making up numbers here, but let's let's just say these things here are dates. I'm going to format those as uh, dates. All right, so I should be able to know. So I'm going to say, uh, I don't know what's the date today. So it's 24th of the 11th. I don't know. It's something yeah. November 24th. 24th. There you go. Okay, so let's let's say we're doing a thing here. Like when, when are we going on holidays? So who's who's taking what time off holidays? So I'm going to go off from the 24th to the. I don't know. <laughs> So the, the, the 6th of June. 4th of the 12th, 22. Steve, when do you want to have... Oh, that's... I just put you in. Um, so that's good. No, that, I'm happy with that. That's a, that's you a can pick my holiday, Steve. <laughs> so let's go from um, uh, the 25th of the 11th, 22. And let's make this go to the 6th of the 12th, 22. So you get the idea of what we're doing here, guys. We're, we're just putting, like, some two dates, start and end dates, right? And I'll put a date in here for Kimberly. We'll put uh, the 28th of the 11th, 22. And we'll make up a date here. We'll go the 7th of the 12th, 22. Okay, so I've got I've got two columns with start and end dates. Now, what I can do now is to say, um, and I forget where this is now, um, <laughs> insert a timeline. There it is there, right? 
So I'm going to insert a timeline. You see it says new. If you haven't noticed this before, go and check it out. It's probably there for you right now. So I'm going to say timeline. And so it says, right, create a timeline. Select your date range. And right now it's selecting everything from A1 to C5. That's perfect. That's selecting exactly the bit I want. That was smart. And that's so it's going to go down there. And it creates this thing called a timeline viewer, right? And this, I can imagine this would be great for Gantt chart type things where you're doing like project planning. It'd be great for um, uh, if you've got your kids doing those things where they're looking at like timelines and historical events. Anything at all that has like a start and end date, this is an, a new format inside Sheets that actually maps this out for you. Now, you can actually uh, make a few changes here. So over the panel, it opens on the right-hand side. You can select the date data range. So if I was to add more data later, later on, I might want to go and expand that range so it includes the new data. Um, it's automatically detected that I have a, had a column called start and another one called end. So it was smart enough to figure that out. But if I had different labels for it, I can come in here and I can actually tell it which column I want to use. It's guessed correctly, so I won't mess that up. And you can also choose what you want to have as the title of that. So by default, I only had the three things, so it's picked name as the obvious one. But you might have something else in there that you want to have, and you can label it with whatever other column you want. And so um, choose card, column, card. You can do colors for things. And, I don't know what that one does. Uh, I need to play with this more. That color one, Chris, um, if you had um, like a, a great big list of tasks, for instance, or, or topics, you could color code by topic or by, say, you had um, a piece of curriculum that was running from here to here. If you had history, then you color all the history ones and you could have the geography ones, which are the interesting ones, obviously. So but, I color code uh, these, Steve. So, so color code the bars, the bars on the timeline. But I think I think it picks it up from here, doesn't it? So if I do it, so like yeah, that, you can choose what you want to do the colors by over here. There you go. So it, it automatically brings the colors across, and it's doing it by using card color and it's pulling the card color from whatever it finds in the name column. So if you get start to get smart with this, and you can start to combine some of the things we've looked at before, like you know we've talked about how you create drop downs inside a sheet, and we've talked about conditional formatting. So you know if the thing in the cell says a certain thing you can get it to color a certain way so you could combine all of those ideas together where you have the you know, drop down lists that self color that's automatically coloring the the, um, uh, the the timeline view so yeah lots of options in there but yeah just go and have a play with this it's a brand new thing inside sheets um, and if you haven't discovered it uh, go check it out all right coming back over here so we've got timeline view now this is uh actually i do the multi-merge tags first because uh, then I'll jump into the admin console and just show you that. So multi-merge tags. Now this is for people who are on plus edition. Uh, for the most part, if you're in a Catholic school anywhere in the East Coast, almost. Uh, if you're in New Zealand, almost every school. Uh, and I think some of our larger customers here in Australia now um, are now using Workspace Plus. So most of you should have access to this. So let me just show you how this works. If I go into my email here and I compose a brand new email, you'll notice, because I'm running the plus edition here, and I guess this is how you'll know if you're on plus or not, whether you get these two little buttons down the bottom here. There's two extra, oh, you know, I didn't tell me I'm not showing my screen. There you go. Now you see my screen. These two little buttons down the bottom corner here, the one that looks like uh, a box and the one that looks like a couple of envelopes. So the one that looks like a box is called, uh, is layouts. So some of you have used services before, like I think probably MailChimp is the one that comes to mind for most people, where you could design really sort of pretty emails. So we've got that now in the plus edition of Gmail. So if you click on that, it opens up this panel and you've got some options in here for making pretty emails. So this is called um, uh, layouts, email layouts. Uh, the default styling button in the bottom corner, if you click on that, you can go in here and you can define like your, your color palette, which font you want to use, uh, if you've got a logo, you can upload a logo into it like that. Uh, you can put footer details in. So if you want to add something at the bottom of every, every email. And finally, if you want to put links in, so I've got email and Twitter here, but you can also add things like um, you know, your website or Facebook or Twitter or you know, the LinkedIn, that kind of thing. So you can add all of those stuff in there if you want. And once you do that, uh, you pick a uh, template. So I'll just pick that one. I like it. And it loads up like that. And so now you've got this sort of uh, template of thing. I'm now going to replace that text with whatever I want to write. 
if there's something in here I don't like, I don't want this button, you can just sorry, you can just click on the button and say remove the button. So very customizable, but it gives you a really good starting point to make a pretty email. If you want to change the picture, you can you can click on the picture and say change the image, put your own image in there, and so on. So if you haven't played with that yet, um, it is for many of you. Can I just have a show of hands if that's showing for you? Yep. So a lot of you have got that. Hey Chris, can you just show um, where that little button was down the bottom again? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm just going to close. I'm going to throw this away and start a new one. I'll hit the compose button, and so it's this little button down here I'm talking about. It says choose layout. If you don't see it, you may still be on the fundamentals version of Workspace. Um, but for many people on Plus, that's where you'll find it right there. That's the choose layouts. Now that's actually not the thing I was trying to show you. I was trying to show you the thing next to it, which is called multi send. So when you send multiple emails, so I'm going to send an email here to Kimberly and to Steve and to uh, Rich. Okay, so all right, so I've got an email going out to is your other address, Steve? I think. Uh, Steve Smith. There you go. So I'm, so I'm sending an email to three people. Now, what would normally happen when I send an email to three people is there would be um, the same email goes out to all three people, and they'd all be CC'd on that email. What multi-send mode does when I turn this on, it actually now will instead of sending one email to three people, it'll send three emails to individual people. Right. So it basically treats it like a mailing list. Uh, and and because <coughs> pardon me because it's treating it like a mailing list, it adds an unsubscribe option. So you know we're effectively doing a bulk email basically, uh, and you have to by law give people the option to unsubscribe. And say it does include that. The other interesting thing about it is when you send it out, um, if you were to look in your sent mail, you won't actually see a copy of all the emails that went out. So imagine if you send this to like you know 100 people. You're not going to go into your sent mail and see 100 emails listed there. You'll see one, and then all the rest are shuffled off to, I think they actually moves it into the bin, and it just keeps the master copy, and you can go back and sort of pull everything out again if you need to for, for your records. But it doesn't actually um, clutter up your sent mail. Now, once you've enabled this multi-send mode, which has actually been there for a little while, the new feature is this. If I go into my email and type an at symbol, it actually brings up some mail merge tags. So I can say at first name. So I could have I, I could have gone and said uh, dear. So dear at first name, comma enter. Right. So I'm now starting to create a somewhat personalised email. Now, right now, the list of personalisation things is still a little bit limited. Right now, you can do first name, surname, full name, or the email address. So right now it's not so open that you can just insert anything in there. I wouldn't be surprised if that comes a little bit further down the track. But right now it's just the ability to personalise the email, and you only get that when you do the um, uh, the multi send mode. Now you can combine the two, and uh, just again I'll just jump back in there. So I'll open a template. I'll pick that template and say insert, and then I'll turn on multi send mode for the template, right? And then I get the same ability here, so I can come in here and say the uh, at first name, and now I'm creating a pretty personalized email, right? So I'm combining those two things. Does that make sense? Awesome. Oh, I'll throw that away. Don't need it. Uh, back to our slides. Um, so that was uh, multi uh, mail merge tags for multi send emails. Bit of a mouthful, but hopefully you understand what that means now. And the oh, I can I can. I don't even need to show you anything for this. Some of you have used Data Studio before. Uh, it's a really great tool for using, uh, for hooking it up to spreadsheets and creating visualizations on those spreadsheets. Um, it's just changed its name. So it's now called Looker Studio instead of Data Studio. Not sure why, but uh, if you see that name, that's what it is. It's just uh, what used to be called Data Studio is now called Looker Studio. Um, other than that, I think it works pretty much the same way. Would that be right, Steve? Yeah, it is. So, so Looker is uh, um, another cloud data visualization product, and they've just kind of merged the two. Um, right. So, Looker has a little bit more to it than Data Studio, but yeah, they merged it too. Still looks the same, Looker Studio, um, and it's a fantastic tool for for giving kids to to understand how to use big data as well. Yeah, nice. All right, um, I am going to. Oh. 
I'll try and show you something here um, and hope I can hope this makes sense for you. So this trust rules in Drive. Again, this is kind of an admin thing. If you're a teacher, you probably can't actually enable this yourself, but you, you might feel the effects of it. So I just want to show you how it works. It's called trust rules. And the, the, what the problem it's designed to solve, right now, if you have workspace set up inside your school and you haven't locked it down in any sort of a way, your kids can take a document and share it with anyone, right? They can share it with another school, they can share it with the public, right? So a lot of schools, they start to lock that down. And they say, okay, we're not gonna allow our school, our kids to share with just anyone, right? We're gonna only allow them to share with other people inside the school. So you can sort of put a few restrictions on it. What Trust Rules does is it gives you a bit more granularity on that. So you might decide to say, I don't want my year five kids emailing my high school kids. My, my, my primary or elementary school kids, I don't want them you know, sharing documents with the high school kids for whatever reason. Um, um, and obviously you turn this on or off as you need. So that's what Trust Rules is. And let me just show you how it looks. So I'm going to go back to the admin console. So this is back in the admin console here. And the way it works is this. So if I go into the rules section, uh, you've got the option down here to create rules. And you see they will all load up there. Now, the way you create a rule is you just hit this create rule button here. And there's four different types of rules you can create. Trust rules is the new one. right? So you can turn on this thing called a trust rule. When you turn on a trust rule, it asks you which group or which organizational unit or group of students or people uh, do you want to have this apply to? And which group do you want to control the interaction with? And you can control whether they share to that group or whether they get shared from that group. So let me just take you to show you one I made earlier. So I've just called this one Chris's Kids, right? Keeping Chris's Kids safe. Uh, and if I go in here and show you what it is, is uh, I think it's in this section here. So I've included an organizational unit called Chris's Kids right and i have then prevented the activity i want to prevent is sharing and receiving when the organizational unit is steve's kids so i think i showed you before in the admin console i've got two groups i've got chris's kids and steve's kids and i've the way this trust rule is set up to demonstrate to you i'm preventing chris's kids from interacting with steve's kids right so what that now means is let me see if i can switch over to this window so you should be able to see that google docs so i'm now logged in as a student so this is helen highwater right who's a student and helen has created a document and she wants to share it with dave who's one of steve's kids so helen's one of my kids dave's one of her, uh, steve's kids why why does your kid get a really cool name like helen highwater and i've got dave no, no offense to dave's out there obviously but come on man Hey, you made the names up, Steve, not me. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, good call, good call. Um, so, I'm, I'm, so Helen's in here now. She wants to share with Dave. So she types in Dave. There's Dave Hoff, right? Which is not even funny. I don't know what, what you were thinking, Steve, seriously. Um, uh, so she wants to share with Dave as an editor. She can do that. She clicks the send button and she gets this message saying, sorry, you can't share. This item can't be shared with Dave because of a Chrome 3 to you sharing policy. And Chrome for either you is our little school pretend school here, right? Yours will say your school name. That's how it looks in practice. So administrators can set up these fences around groups if they need to. I know, um, you know I, I was not a big lockdown guy when I was in a school. I, for me, I'm happy for things to be fairly open, but I also understand schools have policies and somehow sometimes we've got to enact those policies. You've now got the tools to do that if you need to. Right? So trust rules can let you put up these fences around certain groups and certain um, OUs if you need to do that. Does that make sense? All right. That demonstration actually worked. <laughs> uh, and with that, ladies and gentlemen, uh, that's about all we've got to talk about this, this time around. Um, and we're just about right on time. So I'm going to say to you, thank you for, I know some of you have been to lots of these over the last year. We've done uh, February through to November. We're not doing one in December because it's too close to the end of the year. We all just want to go home and go to the beach, right, or something. So um, we're not going to do one in December. Um, oops, sorry. Tab up. That's better. Uh, so that's uh, that's all the ones we've done this year. We've tried to talk about a whole range of different topics. Um, 
and hopefully you've found it interesting. We would love a little bit of feedback on what we've been doing this year. So if you would like, I would, and I would really appreciate it if you did, scan that QR code or go to the link there, bit.ly slash learning with Google underscore feedback, LWG dash feedback, and it's capitalized like that. Um, there's a form you'll find at the end of that. And there's only a couple of questions. I've kept it really short, but we would love some feedback on these uh, webinars that we're doing because we'd like to continue doing them next year. Um, I'm going to give away some prizes. So if you fill in the form, you go in the draw for a prize. I've got 10 prizes. Uh, and and if, they're, if they're Kiwis, Chris, I'll, I'll them. Them. some of them are Googlers. So yeah, there's a pretty good chance you'll win a prize. And I can send some the Kiwis some prizes as well. Awesome. So if I give you a moment, I, I can. I, we can do this one of two ways. I can either just you fill it in and just I'll just do it later and I'll send you some prizes. Or if you want to hang around and do it right now, I will draw the prizes right now, which is always more exciting. You guys happy to do that now? Awesome. Hey, um, Chris, while, while everyone's filling out the form, um, we've talked a bit this year about Chrome OS, OS Flex, and mm. I used Neverware quite a bit um, previously to do things, but I was given a beautiful two-year-old Lenovo X13, which is the, the <clears throat> Windows version of their really nice devices. And I used Flex for the first time today after using Neverware for quite some time, and my beautiful new Lenovo Chromebook is really, really nice to use. It took <laughs> about seven minutes to make the installer. I plugged it into this beautiful two-year-old Windows device, and within about six minutes, it was a beautiful new Chromebook. It is really, really easy. Nice. So if you've had a go with Neverware before, the new way to do it with Flex is just so quick and it is just beautiful. And mm -hmm. I see Jeremy's just turned his camera on and I know that he is quite the don of Flex as well. So Jeremy, do you want to share your experience with it? Sorry team, that was purely coincidental. <laughs> um, yeah, I I, um, I turned a five, six, seven year old end of lease teller um, MacBook into a, um, uh, yeah, put put yeah, flex it, and now it's um it it, it acts as my um, second device that I use. So it's um yeah, really good. Would would, would definitely recommend. Fantastic. Yeah. I had one of our um one of our innovators uh, here in Sydney who was teaching in a school, and he wanted some Chromebooks, and he didn't realise um, that they had a bunch of old Windows machines sitting in a pile somewhere. So he went back and he actually flexed a lot of them, and now they're all in service. So a bunch of computers that were previously basically barely usable and nobody used, uh, now they get used all the time because Flex actually put a new lease of life into them. So definitely a good thing. Yeah, right. so if, if you haven't tried it, that, that's your homework for uh, December and January. Um, so go, go on a Chromebook, get the, uh, get the recovery tool, make yourself a thumb drive and just start flexing things. Nice. Steve, I'm looking at this list of people here who have put their names down. And like I was going to give away 10 prizes, but honestly, there's not many more than 10 people. What about if we just give everyone a prize? Just give everyone a prize was here. Just I reckon if, if you were good enough to come to this very last one of the year, I reckon you deserve a prize. So yeah. uh, what I will do to everyone who well, – fill the form in anyway so I just have a record of who, um, who was here. Did we just have an Oprah Winfrey moment? Yes. Everyone gets a yes. <laughs> I'm sure I can rummage through the swag cupboard at work and we'll find something. Yeah. Hey, Jen, on that point, yeah, there was a question there about flexing Chromebooks. Now, obviously, Chris and I probably can't uh, answer that question, but there might be a couple of people on the call that give you a bit of instructions on, on that because uh, I, I could not possibly comment on that. But I'm sure there are a couple of other people that might be able to help you with that. Because mm. <laughs> we are recording, so I'll say unofficially. All right. Um, well, I'll tell you what, guys, so I can see we've got about 17 people have filled that form in, and, and so I, I'm just going to make an executive decision here and say, if your name is on this list uh, at the end of this call, I'm just going to send you an email to collect uh, 
an address where we can send you something and we'll send everybody on the call something. How about that? All right, and on that note, let me go back to our slides. Not, not, not sure, Donna, if we can we can stretch the cars. It's, uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, it's, it's been a good year, but it hasn't been quite been that good, you know what I mean? All right, um, so uh, all of the past webinars that we've done, as you know, are on that address there, AUNZ underscore webinars, oh, so bit.ly slash AUNZ, AUNZ underscore webinars. Um, uh, that's, that's been a, uh, well, this is kind of a funny thing, at Google, we're not allowed to just go and create websites willy-nilly. They all have to kind of be approved. And so that's why that particular, quote, website is really just a Google slide deck because uh, it's kind of what we could get away with. Um, but next year, I have uh, now got an official place where we can keep all this stuff. So as of next year, we will be moving to a brand new uh, location. Um, and so we're going to continue this next year uh, with our Learn with Google 2023 webinars. Um, again, it's the same, same concept. It'll be a monthly series, uh, third Thursday of every month. Um, same time. It seems to work for a lot of people, unless I read the feedback and you tell me it doesn't. So um, otherwise, uh, I will assume it is. Uh, we'll go February to November again. Um, there'll be a new site for it. So there'll be a new registration page for people. There'll be a new site for the, the recordings to live on. And we'll, we'll let you know all about that as soon as it's all up and running. Um, and if you are registered for 2022, um, I'm just going to migrate everybody across over to 2023 so you don't have to re-sign up for something. And I figure if anyone comes over there and they don't want to be there, there's an unsubscribe button they can take themselves off. That seems to be the easiest way for everyone. So looking forward to seeing you next year. Um, just remember, if you do want a PD certificate for attending today, uh, there is a link there, bit.ly slash GFE certificate. You can fill that in and it will magically email you a certificate if you like such things. Uh, and other than that, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for an amazing 2022. Hope you um, enjoyed these webinars. We've enjoyed doing them for you. and Hope you've enjoyed us doing it to you. <laughs> All right. Uh, with that, I'm going to stop the recording. Uh, Steve, is there anything you wanted to add? No, no, I look like thanks very much, Christopher, for putting, putting these all together. There's so much great information. And um, yeah, it's, it's been really great to have everyone together to do a bit of learning. And hopefully it was it was useful for you. So um, Kakita, have a fantastic Christmas. Yeah, awesome. Thanks, everyone. Enjoy the break.